Next, we will look into testing process, the V model of testing, and the testing pyramid. The test process dimensions that have been introduced so far are shown on the screen. In the first lecture, we covered different quality attributes, um, and we concluded that for each quality attribute, testing or some type, other type of quality assurance measure can be taken. Lectures 2 and 3 covered white box and black box testing. Now we continue by introducing the dimension of test levels. We start by looking at the V model of testing. The V model of testing on the screen matches the familiar waterfall model where you start from the requirements uh, then followed by functional specification, then architectural design follows, module design follows, and coding follows. And this is how the software is supposedly built on the waterfall model. The V model simply extends this model by combining each of the design and specification phase with matching testing phase. So for module design, there is the matching pa pair of unit testing. For architecture design, we have the matching pair of integration tests. For functional specification, matching pair of system testing exists. For requirement specification, there is a matching, matching testing pair of acceptance testing. Now I briefly go over the different testing levels. Unit testing, this is the smallest pieces of software that are tested. And typically this is achieved by different unit testing tools where the programmers write unit tests. For example, using JUnit in Java or unit test library in Python. Next level is the integration testing. So there are multiple units, but not the entire system is tested. The definition of this integration testing depends on the context. So what is actually meant by the integration testing? It's context specific. Uh, inside integration testing, there might be tricky situations. For example, how to test a class containing a database or SQL related code? Well, this requires that the test harness or the test code is able to mimic the behavior of the missing units. So if we assume that the database is not present, this mimicking uh, can be done by different means that are not covered in this course any further. If you are interested, you can look up uh, your, your most favorite search engine regarding test doubles, test dummies, fakes, stubs, and mocks. Going up on the testing levels, we next come to the system testing. There, the entire system is tested. This can be automated or manual. If it's automated, typical tools that are used are uh, Selenium and its popular alternatives. Finally, we come to the acceptance testing. These terms come from the project-oriented world where the acceptance testing was required before the system could be delivered to use. So it was also part of the formal uh, contract criteria. So the acceptance testing must be passed uh, before the software project has fulfilled its contract. Uh, acceptance testing is done by the real users and obviously it is coming from the user's perspective and from the user processes viewpoint. And acceptance testing is not something that is done by, by the development organization. The development organization can, or, can organize the acceptance testing, but they do not actually conduct it. So they can con invite customers to perform acceptance testing, for example, or they deliver the system to the customer environment so that the customer de tests the system in, in their environment. Okay, so not part of the figure, but I have added 
another layer on top of the system testing. So this is, we could see this as an alternative to the acceptance testing path. So if your system uh, is part of a larger system, then a system of system testing, SOS, would be conducted. So what would be such a larger system? Well, we could say that the telecom network is an example of a very large system. So we could have a system that runs inside a base station. Uh, those are the network links that are, that are very close to you in those antennas you can see. So that would be a one system, but this base station system has to work in the context of the entire telecom system. So therefore, once the base station system testing has been conducted, uh, there must be systems of system testing to ensure that we can actually have um, uh, have phone, call, phone calls go through and, and the data to move in the network. It is not enough that I have a connection from my cell phone to the base station and that link works. Because if nothing goes on from the base station to the uh, network beyond that, then for the user's viewpoint, it's not really helpful. Let's have a look at the implications of the V-mod. It helps to have a blueprint laid out in advance in software engineering. And in blueprint, in this case, we mean technical specification or design or anything else that is flowing from here on, on the left side of this image. So a requirements document would be considered a blueprint. Functional specification would be a blueprint. Architectural design, module design are considered as blueprints. So it is easier to think a product in hierarchy of these blueprints. It is also a good idea to test each, the, each of the blueprints. And it's good to use each of these blueprints or design as basis for testing, as then you have some means how you can evaluate uh, the testing. For example, it is quite difficult to do good acceptance testing if you do not have requirement specifications, so you could compare uh, your testing results against the acceptance testing results. Other implications are that it is much easier to find faults in smaller units than in larger entities. And this is why we start from the bottom. So first one conducts unit testing, as if there happens to be a defect, it is much easier to fix it to the source code, because the unit tests are very close to the source code level. Uh, and this is in comparison to the acceptance testing level, whereas if you find a defect, it can take, you know, hours, days, or, or even weeks to, to find a defect in the source code and then to fix this source code. And also testing larger unit can be carried out more easily when the smaller pieces are already tested. And this is because there are less defects that one could run into. Uh, if, if the product is very defect ridden no, none of the lower levels have been tested, then there can easily be a problem that accept testing is simply not doing any testing at all, but simply waiting for the bugs to be fixed and the entire acceptance testing team uh, is simply waiting for the fixes. Another implication of the model is that the, the V model, it is, it's that it's better to finish a task before starting working another task. So it's sort of a success that you do these tasks in order, where you first, where you complete the requirements, functional spec, architecture design, module design, then you do coding, you finish the coding, do unit test, integration test, and so on. Looking at the benefits of the V model, we can claim that the model is intuitive and easy to explain. Uh, it matches the familiar waterfall model, so it's basically only an extension of that. It makes a good model for training people. Um, it shows how testing is related to other phases of, of the waterfall process. It's also quite adaptable to various situations, assuming that the team is experienced and understands the, the inherent limitations of the model. 
some of the inherent limitations could be, for example, that requirements are never really finalized, but, but new requirements coming all the time, users change their minds and so on. So in the, in the, in the Wii model world, this would be a huge problem as you would need to go through all of these phases at, at once. But if you understand that, that there might be some new requirements coming in later, then you can sort of anticipate it also in the later phases. So this is what is meant by the team understanding some of the model limitations. Uh, it certainly beats the, the code and fix approach on any larger project. So this code and fix approach is basically where you don't have where you don't have any software engineering processes at place. You simply code whatever the customer is, is demanding and you have not planned for any of any of the testing. So this kind of approach can be really problematic as especially when the, the, when the projects grow larger. Of course, for a small project, the code and fix approach can work very well if the, if the developers are competent. So here are some of the weaknesses of the V model from Brian Marrick and, and James Christie. Uh, so they claim that, that the model is vague. Um, this, is, this is true. It's also very document driven. So it relies on the existence and existence accuracy and the timeliness of the documentation. Uh, and it also, also the model also asserts that that each of these phases is only tied to a single design phase, which is not true. It also communicates change poorly. So it doesn't show how the fixes and test rounds are handled. So it only shows that we go to so it implies that you go through once and then the product is complete. So do you do unit testing one, integration testing at once? Where in reality you would have multiple testing rounds of, of unit testing. Uh, testing windows get squeezed and this is simply because they are at the end of the project. So typically at the end of the project you are already in a quite big time pressure. Uh, maybe you have contractual obligations to finalize the project, so then the final testing windows, the system testing window gets smaller, acceptance testing windows get smaller, so they get squeezed and there is less time to do proper testing. And then there is a risk that you actually really release a faulty product. It's based on the simplistic waterfall model and it doesn't really fit iterative and agile development at all. So due to the inherent limitations, the V model has not been so popular in the testing books anymore. However, the testing levels are still live and very relevant. They are just shown with the different type of figure these days. So here is the testing pyramid. What this model tries to communicate is that you have many unit tests shown at the lowest level with the, with the largest area and you have few acceptance tests. So they are at the top and you have only very few of these. And still some of the ideas are the same. So you have a many unit tests uh, you have quite many integration tests, then you have fewer system test tests and then you have very few acceptance tests. So you build up the quality from the bottom. So these unit tests ensure that the basic functionalities are working. Integration tests ensure that the, the units works together. Uh, system tests ensure that the system works. And finally, at the top level, the customer accepts the system for use. Uh, and you only need very few acceptance tests on the top when you have already done good quality assurance on the lower levels by having many unit tests, many integration tests, and even some system tests. For example, the book Software Engineering at Google states that 80% of their tests at Google are unit tests. So the properties of the tests at the bottom are, is that they are cheap, to develop and run, they are fast, they are artificial, they are small and they are simple. So this is true for the unit test. 
And this is in contrast with acceptance tests that are at the bottom, that are in the top. So they are expensive, they are slow to execute, they are realistic, uh, they are large, and they are complex. So it is quite expensive and slow to do acceptance testing. But you still do it because it's very realistic, it puts the system into a complex situation, and it covers uh, a large part of the software from the user's viewpoint. Uh, you prefer to have many unit tests because they are cheap, fast, and simple. This also obviously implies that shall there be a defect in the unit testing level, it is easy to debug and fix. Shall you find a defect at the top level, it would be quite slow and complicated to fix. And if you go to your favorite image search engine, you can see different versions of the testing pyramid. For example, the first result here has unit tests, acceptance tests, system and constraints tests, exploratory tests, and other. Uh, and they claim that uh, tests on the lower level are automatically executed, while the tests at the top level are manually executed, uh, which can be typically the case. Uh, they also st state that tests uh, at the very top are not, not practical to automate. Exploratory testing is for finding gaps. Uh, and then they have a sort of area that is highlighted for acceptance and regression testing harness. Uh, the next figure highlights levels of unit component integration system acceptance alpha and beta testing. Um, they refer to these lower levels as technology-related testing, and the top levels would be business-related testing. Uh, uh, this image over here uh, has automated tests basically all the way. So they have automated unit tests, automated component integration and API tests, and automated graphical user interface tests. And then sort of outside of the pyramid, they have manual session-based testing. And they also claim the ratios so that on bottom level, it should be 70%, middle level 20%, and top level 10%. As you can see, there is no official standard for this testing pyramid, but everyone has sort of their own interpretation of it. The commonalities are quite clear to see. So at the top bottom level, we have a large body of unit tests that are typically automated. These are sort of ensuring that the technology um, developed in the software works. And then on the, on the top level, we have manual tests or business tests or acceptance tests that ensures that the software satisfies the problem that the customer is trying to or wanting, to, wanting it to solve. Now we have added the third dimension on the test process dimension. So we still have the quality attribute viewpoint for software testing or quality assurance here on, on the z-axis coming directly to you. Then there is the accessibility based or the, or the knowledge source based viewpoint on the x axis. So, do you use white box testing and code coverage, or do you use requirements, documents, and black box testing? And then on the y axis, we have the test levels so, unit tests, integration tests, system tests, and acceptance tests. And so far, we have three dimensions for testing. But there is more, as we shall see in the next video clip.